the three R's today, and uh, we started out with, uh, I'll have to get my notes here, make sure I get them right. Uh, <clears throat> redemption, reconciliation, now we're going to look at reigning. And uh, Alan got some hogs here a while back. Most of you don't know what that meant right there, but <laughs> you ever walk out in a hog lot? <laughs> you can't miss it. <laughs> <clears throat> One of the things I would like to mention to you before we get started is our conference this fall. The weekend after Labor Day, we've always had a, a conference in the last 30-some years. I don't even know how long it's been. But we, Brother Jordan has come down now for whatever, however many years it's been, and he speaks on Friday evening and Saturday uh, a couple of times, and uh, we have a real good time over the weekend. Now, our conference may be a little different than some of the conferences you go to. I do not assign them a topic or anything. And uh, this year, <clears throat> just like all the rest of them, I have not assigned them a topic. Uh, Charlie McClellan's coming, and uh, Charlie, I don't see him. He may, may not be here this morning. Anyhow, I told him to, uh, when he comes down, bring a spade and a shovel and uh, a backhoe because we want to get down and dig into the scriptures as deep as we can go. And that's what we do on uh, the conference that we have there at Ridge Farm. Now, if the weekend after Labor Day, that's September this year, the 3rd, 4th, 11th, 12th, and 13th, and when you get there, we take care of all your food and everything, and uh, you just eat with us and so on and so forth, and uh, motels and hotels are either in Danville or Paris, that's Paris, Illinois, that's not the Paris, France, <laughs> and there's some uh, flyers, or there was some out there in the uh, hall and be sure and pick up one of them if you run out of them, like copy them or whatever you want to do with them. Uh, but we do really appreciate having you down there this fall. And uh, so we look forward to that. Well, this morning I'm supposed to look at uh, reigning with Christ, reigning today on this earth. How do we reign with Christ? And then how are we going to reign in the future? in eternity with Christ. So, uh, is this thing right? I've lost 10 minutes already. <laughs> Let's have a word. Pardon? Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody got a hammer? <clears throat> Let's have a word of prayer and then we get started. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, for that blood that was shed for us on the cross because we know that without him we could be nothing. We would be absolutely worthless. We'd be headed for the, literally for the lake of fire, for your trash. And we praise you that you saw fit to save us from the mess that we were in, that you gave us an eternal hope, and we have an eternal reigning with Christ. In whose name we pray, amen. amen. Turn to Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. Now, my Bible is uh, getting, just like me, it's getting old. And uh, it doesn't, the pages want to, they're so frayed and fuzzy that they stick together and they don't want to turn. I get down to the last couple of chapters and they don't want to open up. So I'll probably be the last one getting there. Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Now we've seen uh, in chapter 6 that uh, many things that we wanted to look at this, this morning and I didn't know how in the world I was going to get all that done. But I'm thankful that Rodney helped yesterday and so forth and he went through that and done a fine job of talking about some of the things that's going to take place in Romans chapter 6 and what has taken place. And uh, he saved me about 50 minutes right there <laughs> because I tried to 
to run over all this while I was at home, and it just took me six hours. So uh, I hope you brought your dinner bucket with you. Because when we go to the field, we don't stop at noon. We just uh, take our dinner with us. And, and we do call it dinner and supper. Because Amen. did the Lord have the last dinner? <laughs> How do we reign today in life? I'm going to spend most of my time on the reigning in eternal, in our eternal life because we pretty well covered the reigning today in this life on this earth. And how are we going to reign in this life on this earth? Uh, if you turn to Romans chapter 6, and we're going to have to use a couple of verses here. Uh, in Romans chapter 6, uh, or, uh, we see in verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Let not sin reign in your life. You know, there's three different words we pronounce the same way. Reign, and we've had plenty of that in this past growing season and here even this week here in Chicago. You all know what that is. That's that wet stuff falls out of the sky. And uh, sometimes you're really grateful for it, and sometimes you wish you'd shut it off, uh, like, kind of like right now. Then there's reigning. you you got the reins on a horse. And you steer that horse however way, way you want him to go, and you, you teach him to neck rein and so on and so forth, and you know how you do that across the reins. And, well, uh, then you have the reining like a, a, a king. That's the reining we're going to look at today. Now, he says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, in that body that we're living in today. Because he, that we're going to get a different body someday. So with Christ in us, he's paid the price already for us. He's bought us, and we're his. But we're still in this mortal body. What is sin? Turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Now, I realize that uh, these are epistles given to the Hebrews and to the nation of Israel. But there are things that are described in there in those epistles that you won't find anywhere else. So let's look down about uh, verse 13, 14, and 15, and we'll see what sin is. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, you go through that passage right there and think about those things, and then go back and read in Genesis chapter 3, how Satan approached Eve and Adam and think about all those things it says there in James and everything falls right in place. How much of that's changed till today? Not one thing. When a man is drawn away of his own lust, what's lust? Man, I'd like to have that thing. And enticed. What does Satan do? What what? What's a salesman there for? He entices you to go ahead and buy it, doesn't he? Do you need it? Well, you've lived your whole life up to this point without it. Why do you need it all of a sudden now? <laughs> and you drag your thing home, and now where am I going to put it? <laughs> so we have that is what sin is. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Back to Romans chapter 5. We're going to, if you're going to get tired of looking at these verses, trying to look them up, verse 12, just write them down and I'll look them up and read them for you. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter, but you need to wear the pages out on your Bible like I have. 
Romans 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. How many people do you know that's 200 years old? What happened to them? They died. Now, Paul's been married, uh, what, seven years longer than we have. He's going to have his 60th, or you had, had your 60th? Had it? Well, we've had 53, or we'll have 53 in September. And uh, I've been farming 55 years. So uh, I've been around uh, the hog lots and so forth a little longer than I've been around my wife. <laughs> but uh, that's the best thing that ever happened to me, uh, my wife, not the hog lot. Uh, <laughs> now when sin came in how did it come in I've got to keep an eye on this thing here turn to Genesis chapter 1 26, verses 26 and 7 Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27 <clears throat> When God created man, he placed him on the earth, and that's the last thing he created. Man was the very final thing that he created. And he set him to have dominion over the earth. Look at what it says in verses 26 and 27, Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now keep in mind, he made him in his image and in his likeness. Do what Rodney did. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. See that dominion? Over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And he placed them on this earth, and he gave them dominion over the earth. That's like they reigned over the earth. How did he create man in his own image? Well, what did man look like? Turn to Psalms 104 and the first two verses. Psalms 104 and the first two verses, and we'll see how man looked when God first created him. We want to see what God looked like, and it tells us right here in Psalms 104 and the first two verses, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. How did God put Adam and Eve on the earth? In honor and majesty. They reigned over the earth. They had the dominion over everything that was on that earth. Now notice verse 2. Who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Who covers thyself with light. When God created man in his own image, he was covered with light, didn't he? But when he sinned, God said, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt, what? Surely die. What happened? His lights went out. Where do you think they get that statement? Right there. Right there in the Word of God. In Romans 3, let's go back to Romans chapter 3. And verse 23, if you don't already know it, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why was it the Apostle Paul the first one to say that? You know, had all men sinned when Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? And they sinned when Joshua wrote his book. How come Paul was the first one to say that? You ever think about that? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If we've all sinned, what, does, what did we find that sin finally brought out? Death. Well, turn to chapter 6 and verse 23 again. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. The wages of, you're going to get paid for all the sin. And in this mortal body, that's what we're going to get paid for. 
Well, what about what causes that sin? Where is that sin? Turn to Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17. I'm not sure, but I'll show you this one, one other time. Leviticus chapter 17 and uh, about verse 11. Leviticus 17 and verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. What is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul? I want to look more at the first phrase in that verse than the rest of the verse. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. But what the wages of sin is death. If the wages of sin is death, and the life of the flesh is in the blood, where's the death of the flesh? Where is it? In the blood. Why did we sin? You ever hear a statement, that guy, it's just in his blood to be like that. Where'd that statement come from? Same place. So, show me somebody that's not a sinner. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How are we going to reign over sin today? Turn to Romans chapter 6 again and verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. We have the choice. To let sin reign or not to. We, and if you go back up in chapter 6 there, you find the two natures. Whichever one you're serving is the one that's going to win. We have the choice of serving the new nature, that godly nature, that nature that God has given us, that's in Christ and we're in him, or we can go back and do the same old things we've been doing in the past. And God forbid that we should do that. We don't want to make that a habit. We want to make it a habit of serving the new nature. Well, if we look at all these places and we see Paul saying, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he is the first one in the scripture to tell us about the glory of God. Or tell us that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Well, what does the glory of God look like? Anybody know what the glory of God looks like? There's some here that do because I think we've already explained that to you before. Turn to uh, Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. I just lost the little round ball on the speaker thing here. Ezekiel chapter 1. Now it got me all gummed up here and I don't even know where I'm at. Verse 28. There it is on the floor. Still work? Y'all hear me? All right, good enough. Verse 28, as the appearance of the bow is in the cloud in the day of rain. Now, he's, if you look at Ezekiel in chapter, all your major prophets would give you a date and tell you when that book was written. Some of the minor prophets do too. So uh, you'll find that in the first couple, three verses. But here we have Ezekiel telling us about the living creatures, and so forth, and what he sees. Verse 28 again, As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. Now he's talking about a throne, and he saw this man seated on his throne. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. What's the bow in the day of rain called? Rainbow. What's the glory of God look like? It looks like a rainbow then. I don't see anybody here that looks like the glory of God. 
There ain't no rainbow around any of you. <laughs> How's comes? Why? We're still living in a mortal body. And what's in our blood? Sin. Well, what are we going to do about it? If those things took place and God has called us for his glory, what's he going to do with it? What's he going to make out of it? What's the eternal reigning with Christ going to be like? What's it going to do? Well, I just well throw them away because I really, they don't do any, any good right now anyway. <clears throat> that, that's what happens. You, you get started and you start chasing rabbits, and uh, pretty soon you're way over there. Well, did you ever wonder why we have a Bible written down in words? How did God communicate with man from Adam to Moses? How did everybody know what God was doing? Well, let's say, it's, well, we got the thing right here. From here to here, Moses and Abraham are approximately halfway in between from here to here. But look how much more time we give to this. Why is that done that way on that chart? That's the way the scriptures are written. You got how many chapters here before you find out about Abraham? Eleven. But that's half the distance from Adam to the cross. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever wonder how long Paul's ministry was? I'll we'll figure that out sometime. It was twenty-five to thirty years. And uh, all the things that he's given us was given in that 25 to 30 years. But what about all these things back here? How did God communicate with man from here to here? Of course, when, when he called out Moses uh, 430 years after Abraham, he had him write it down in a book, didn't he? But what about prior to that? When God created the earth, go to Job. Chapter 38, Job chapter 38. I asked, we've got uh, two of our granddaughters up here, and each one brought a friend with them. And uh, I asked them last night, Job 38 verse uh, 7. Did God do something? Well, the first question I asked him was, what order did God create the heaven and the earth? Is it just like it says, God created the heaven and then the earth? Is that the order? Yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that's the order. But did he create something between the time he created heaven and the time he created the earth? Yeah. You know, I wouldn't ask you that if it hadn't been a yes answer. What was it? Look in chapter 38 of Job, and uh, he's, God is talking to Job here. He's asking a whole bunch of questions about creation. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth in verse 4 and so on and so forth? And uh, the foundations, uh, are fat, where are they fastened? Where's the cornerstone and so on? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. When the morning stars sang and the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, if those sons of God and those morning stars here saw and shouted when God created the earth, they had already been there, didn't they? Hmm. Where did they come from? Turn to uh, Psalms. Now, how do we know that these, these stars here that he's talking about is angels. What did God do on the fourth day? He put the sun, the moon, and the what? 
stars in the heavens. Turn to Psalms 33 and verse 6. Psalms 33 and verse 6. Where do those angels come from? Where do all of the, the uh, you know, when those angels announced the birth of Christ, it caused them to ho heavenly host? Well, there's a reason for that. Look in Psalms 33 and verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. And all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He spoke them into being, didn't he? He didn't create them out of the dust of the ground. He spoke them into being. There wasn't any dust of the ground yet at that time. So they, but they did look like men, didn't they? When we go to Genesis chapter 19 and we see Lot and the problems he had, and God sends these two angels, and it calls them angels, and then it calls them men, and then it calls them angels, and then it calls them men again. Guess what they look like? Must be like men. Turn to chapter, uh, in, in Psalms, turn to chapter 19 now. Now we've got the heaven and the earth created because God had an audience there when he created the earth. And they shouted for joy. Now I want you to see something here in Psalms 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech. Whoa, wait a minute. How can a planet utter speech? And night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Now, Brian, aren't you an English teacher? You're pretty good with English, a lot better than I was. I thought I was doing fine in English until I found out what that really meant. You see that fourth verse? Their line is going through, out, through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Now, those two words aren't spelled the same either, are they? The earth and the world, are they the same? No. If you were here about seven, eight years ago, Brother Jordan and Rodney both made a, a very good explanation of the distinction between the earth and the world. The earth is the planet. The world is the government systems with an S on the end of it. Now, look at that third verse. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. It's heard everywhere. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. What is a line of words? It's a sentence. How did God communicate with man from here to here? In the stars. That was the declaring the glory of God. How many hours have I got left? I got to cut something out. Jude verse six. You all know what that meant. Uh, well, I'll turn there and we'll see. I want to get it word for word. Don't want to mess something up. Jude verse six. And the angels which kept not their first estate. What's an estate? That's a pretty good sized thing with some property, right? but left their own habitation. What's a habitation on an estate? That's where you live. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under judgment of the great day. By the time God told Moses to write all these things in a book, what had happened? Those angels had left their 
estate and their habitation and were not doing what they were supposed to have been doing in the first place. Did God ever create something and say, well, you can just sit down under a shade tree and throw a fish and hook in there and try to catch fish and you can just do that all day, your whole life. He had a purpose behind everything, didn't he? What was the purpose of those angels? Well, to glorify him with what? His word. They had his word. And he, they were to take, guess who steps in? And what's he look like? Did you ever look at all? I'm, we're just going to have to go through this real quick. Did you ever look at all the colors that... Ezekiel and uh, Isaiah tell about uh, Lucifer being covered with. We had one of the fellows in our, in our group down home looked up all the colors. You know what colors they were? They were the exact colors of something else. Rainbow. The rainbow. He was the most glorious creature that God ever created. He was full of wisdom. He steps in there and he says, well, boy, if I'm this great and this important, I'd just well, be the top dog. And he sinned. And we know what his eventual demise is going to be. He's not going to disappear, but he's sure going to lose his status. Now... Why, we asked you a question there a while ago. Why was Paul the first one to say, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Who knew anything about this until the apostle Paul came along? Nobody. Did Satan realize what God was going to do then? Nope, had no idea whatsoever. But he did come along in in. Uh, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, that's the person of Jesus Christ, isn't it? That's the Creator Himself. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Was He at that time the glory of God? He came down, he paid the price, he became a man, didn't he? But when he ascended back into heaven, God set him where? At his own right hand. And waiting for a specific point in time. And the one thing he did was something that Satan had never thought about. He told a secret. He says, what, what happened back here when he called out Abraham? Why did he call out Abraham? In Romans chapter 1, you find out what happened. The Gentiles didn't even want to keep God in their mind. They were so rotten, so lousy. They had come down to the point that they was worshiping idols of the things of man, four-footed beasts, creeping things, and things in heaven. What a bunch of knotheads. You know who that was? Our forefathers. Now what changed from that day until the day you and I was saved? Now who's the knothead? But what did God say I'm going to do with that group of knotheads? Well, you go to Romans chapter 2 and he says, well, we've got this nation we was going to make them a great nation if they obeyed my word and followed my commandments I'd set them up over the whole earth have they done that did they keep his commandments what did they do with his commandments they made idols out of them didn't they they broke them and they made idols out of parts of them Oh, we got this, and we got that, and you got nothing. Well, they don't have anything either because they ruined it. That's how Paul could say, 
all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There was nothing on the earth. Satan thought he had God in the corner. There was nothing on the earth that could be viewed as glorious. Satan had it all. So what's he do? He calls this guy out by the name of Saul of Tarsus, and he's on the road to Damascus, and he's going to kill off a bunch of those people, those silly fools that are doing what God said to do, and uh, we're going to straighten this thing out. And it's strange when he answers, Who art thou, Lord? He knew who he was, didn't he? He knew exactly who he was. Why? He saw him. He saw him and all his, his risen position. Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 16. We're spending a lot of time in Romans, aren't we? Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. He gave that man a message. He says, I want you to go to the Gentiles and the Jews both, the Jew first and then also to the Greek. And then you've heard the verses and so forth this week, how he gave the, his defense at, at trials and so forth and how God sent him to the Gentiles. When was anybody ever sent to the Gentiles from here back to here? They had the word in the sky, so they started worshiping the stuff that they saw. Those people need the word. Here's what I want you to tell them. The Spirit itself, verse 16, Romans 8, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If they believe what I say about my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to be children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. What does that mean, suffer? In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and that's my other verse I'm supposed to be looking at this more this afternoon. That's still morning, isn't it? Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter two and verse twelve. If we suffer we shall also reign with him. If we deny him he will also deny us. Look at back up at verse nine. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Paul suffered physically, didn't he? Now, does that word suffer has several different meanings? Is the word in verse 9, where I and I suffer trouble, the same as it is if we suffer, we shall also reign with him? Do they have the same meaning? Nope. Turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. You say, well, that's, a John, that's when John baptized the Lord. Verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered, said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. What did he do? Went ahead and baptized him, didn't he? He took and sprinkled him with water and so forth, just like he said he was going to, like God said to do. Did Jesus Christ need to be saved? Well, he was baptized with water. Don't people tell you that? Ask them if they tell you, oh, you've got to have water to be saved. Ask them how come Jesus Christ was baptized then. That puts a knot in the rope. What is it 
about the body of Christ. All of them, all, everybody this week has talked about being in Christ and Christ in us. What's he going to do with us after we're... I wonder how if I can hit that wall with that thing. <clears throat> What's he going to do with us after this life? The wages of sin is death. Well, we're in a sinful body, aren't we? We've still got that sin in our blood. But do we have to obey it? Nope, it's our choice now. Can an unsaved person live a godly life? Not possible, is it? Not possible. But what's he going to do with us? Turn to, uh, oh man, I've got to cut out a lot of this. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. 1 Corinthians 15. Fifty one. Behold I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now think about this. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now turn to uh first Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four. And we want to see something that Paul says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So God inspired Paul to write these down. In chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians and verses 16 and 17. Now keep this in mind. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them or go before those that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. How fast are we going to be changed? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. How did those angels come into being? The Lord spoke them into being, didn't he? What's he going to do with us with that glorified new body? He's going to speak it into being. What are we going to do then? He's going to descend... From heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God and the dead, and Christ shall rise first, and so forth. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So it's Christ in us, and we're in Christ. Is Christ not the Word of God? Are we not joint heirs with Christ? What are we going to be looking after our entire <coughs> eternity? The Word of God. You see why we're glorious? Have you ever seen the Northern Lights? Anybody ever here seen the Northern Lights? I, I, the only thing I've ever seen is what I saw on television. You know what colors are in those Northern Lights? The same color as the rainbow. <coughs> is it a terrible sight or is it a beautiful thing? Beautiful sight. What's the body of Christ going to do for eternity? We're that beautiful sight with the Word of God. Why do you think, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We've got 23 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> In Ephesians chapter 1 and also in Colossians chapter 1. And uh, it tells us that we uh, start with verse 16. Cease not to give thanks for you, missing, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you. <laughs> Fixed that, didn't I? No, I didn't even have a hammer. <laughs> that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory 
of his inheritance in the saints. What's he going to inherit in the saints? The complete word. The completed word. Is there ever going to be a possibility that that is going to change or we're going to lose it? Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've done for us through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for that eternal hope that we have only in him. And that we can look to no other for that. In our Savior's name, amen.